Welcome back to the design of the Space Shuttle, a look at the long and winding road that led to NASA's Space Shuttle. In this episode, we look at some of the efforts of Bell Aircraft, and then the program which led to the X-20 Dinosaur. The craft you see here is Bell Aircraft's BOMI, which stood for Bomber Missile, and this uh, version of the design is from 1955, also known as MX-2276. Following World War II, Kraft Eric and Walter Dornberger from Von Braun's Pinamunda rocket facility joined Bell Aircraft and brought with them notions of the Sanger Silverbird skip glide technique, as well as the plans of the A-9 Intercontinental Bomber. The BOMI was a combination of both ideas and came in two formats, the simple version launched at the top of a rocket and the version launched on the back of a flyback first stage. The Air Force funded the study and the concept on top of the rocket would eventually be the basis of the X-20 dinosaur design. The version you see here used five V-2 derived engines on the first stage, a single V-2 derived engine on the second stage, and then finally an X-15 engine on the BOMI craft itself. Of course, Bell could have designed its own engines, it had rocket engine experience through the X-1 project and ultimately made the engine for the Agena upper stage. The primary goal of BOMI in 1955 was the intercontinental delivery of nuclear weapon. At that time, there weren't intercontinental ballistic missiles yet, and so this was considered a viable means of evading interception. And of course, something hypersonic like this could easily evade anything that could intercept it at the time. Of course, this design was not meant to go all the way to orbit, it was meant to deliver the nuclear weapon on a suborbital basis and then skip off of the atmosphere and somehow get back home by repeatedly skipping off of the atmosphere. As you can see on this globe, it doesn't get very far with the current engines and even with more efficient engines, it would be very difficult to dip down in the atmosphere, drop a weapon on the target and then skip enough to get back home. But they didn't know enough about the properties of the atmosphere to figure that out and of course there was the matter of heating, which was a great uncertainty at this point. In 1956, the BOMI was turned into the brass bell design, and that had ventral stabilizers, vertical stabilizers on the bottom of the wing, and those would have been very difficult to protect uh, thermodynamically from the rigors of re-entry, uh, but it was just not clear that that was going to be the case. Bell Aircraft's main contribution to the design of the space shuttle then was in investigating all sorts of thermodynamic systems in order to cool the spacecraft. And three solutions it came up with was the X-15 hot structure, which it decided was not going to be sufficient, a coolant structure and various types of coolant structures that would run active coolant throughout the space plane, and a water wall combined with shingles. And ultimately, there were engineers at Bell Aircraft that leaned towards the system that would eventually be adopted, which was ceramic tiles. It's worth mentioning at this point that in the BOMI design, the entire forward compartment was the escape system in case of disaster. Eric and Dornberger at Bell Aircraft envisioned their system to be more than just a weapon system. And here we see the Eric Dornberger hypersonic transport designed in 1957. This took a BOMI-derived space plane and placed it on top of a flyback booster. And that flyback booster in this case having four V2-derived engines plus two ramjets. Apparently the sheer per passenger cost of such a system was not considered a barrier at the time to its feasibility. Also in 1957, Dornberger was eagerly presenting variants of the BOMI as a possibility to launch the first person in space, of course this was 1957, and at the time Sputnik had not yet been launched, much less Vostok. Bell Aircraft expressed extreme confidence that they had worked out all the technical details, uh, which they definitely had not. Uh, ultimately, of course, the Mercury capsule was chosen for the first American crewed space flight, and that would occur after the first Soviet space flight on Vostok 1. None of the space plane designs would have been ready in time to beat either Vostok or Mercury. One difficulty with the hypersonic transport was the sheer matter of separating the vehicles at supersonic speeds. And as we see here, that does not go well in this case. Though, potentially measures could have been taken to, to make this a little bit more successful. 
In August of 1957, the Air Force brought together Bell's Brass Bell program, the Highward's Hypersonic Weapons program, and Boeing's Robo program to make the Dinosaur program. Dinosaur is spelled D-Y-N-A-S-O-A-R and it stands for Dynamic Soaring, which is what Eugen Sanger called the skipping re-entry. And so that flight profile is still very much informing the designs at this stage. Of course, that flight profile will not inform the design of the space shuttle, though the space shuttle still retains some of the large delta wing aspects of these early designs. There were many proposals, but all involved basically a small craft being launched at the top of a rocket like BOMI, and not piggyback like Navajo or the Eric Dornberger hypersonic transport. These were all then precursors to the current Dream Chaser project from the Sierra Nevada Corporation. The Air Force ultimately preferred Boeing's spacecraft, and so this is Boeing's design for the X-20 Dinosaur, but instead of using the Atlas Centaur rocket as Boeing proposed, they went with Martin Bell's choice of launcher, which was the Titan rocket. It was originally going to use a Titan I rocket for suborbital launches, and a Titan II rocket for orbital launches, just like the Gemini spacecraft. And this was the Titan II rocket in this version here. By default, it accommodated a single astronaut, but it did have room to potentially add an extra seat for a second astronaut, and overall it had a mass of about 4 tons. What you see there is its service module, which is analogous to the service module on the Gemini spacecraft. For its mass, it does have an enormous wing, and that is because it is still intended to use the skip glide technique, and so it has to have an enormous amount of lift. In fact, its wing loading is much better than most modern airliners, 161 kilograms per meter squared compared to 578 kilograms per meter squared for a Boeing 777. Also, unlike a lot of the earlier designs, it had a flat bottom like the shuttle eventually has, and that is because that provided the simplest way to provide thermal protection. This launch of the dinosaur left it with a negative periapsis, but that didn't need to be the case. It could have gotten to full orbit, and as far as skip gliding was concerned, it didn't do enough of a good job to convince me that it would be able to, for instance, drop a bomb on the target and then managed to return back home. That seems to be a stretch as far as skip gliding is concerned. Ultimately, by the time the X-20 really got into development after they had picked their design and were really working on testing it, it was already 1962, and Vostok 1 had occurred, Yuri Gagarin had made it to space, and John Glenn had also made it to orbit. And so that purpose wasn't entirely clear anymore. In order to compete with Gemini-type missions, it was placed on an upgraded launcher, this is the Titan 3 c though its boosters aren't the normal boosters for a Titan 3 c These are UA-1204s that were designed for the Dinosaur program, and the Titan 3 c normally has UA-1205s. These do not have the same burn time or thrust, and that's because, of course, they wanted to limit G-forces for the astronaut and really didn't need the extra Delta V. Otherwise, the Titan III had upgraded engines from the Titan II. These are LR-87-9s as opposed to the Titan II's LR-87-7. And the upper stage is an LR-91-9 as opposed to LR-91-7. But it also had a third stage, a trans stage, and that's what you will see next. And that trans stage had two AJ-10-138s, developing a total of 71 kilonewtons of thrust. And so here we have staging. And that provided this system with quite a lot of delta-v. In fact, it will make orbit with more than 1,800 meters per second left. So it is being launched on a larger launch vehicle than the Gemini spacecraft would have been. But it does have much more capability thanks to that. Incidentally, in 1959, after North American's own proposal for the X-15 variant fell through, the one that was supposed to launch the first person into space, Boeing asked North American to look into a reusable launch vehicle for Dinosaur. And that would later lead to all sorts of designs for the space shuttle, which involved something like Dinosaur, just larger, being launched on top of a flyback booster. Ultimately, Dinosaur was cancelled because its purpose was vague, uh, it was beaten by Vostok 1 and Mercury as far as manned spaceflight, and it looked like it would be beaten by the Gemini capsule as well. As far as nuclear weapon delivery, it was beaten by ballistic missile technology. Of course, that would avoid interception already and didn't require crew. 
orbital reconnaissance, it was somewhat beaten by regular satellites, but it wasn't clear that satellites could give the same sort of results that putting a person into space to spy on enemies would. And so one concession was that once the Air Force lost the dinosaur program, they got the manned orbital laboratory, which was seen as the next Air Force project in space after this. Now, of course, that would eventually be canceled with the advent of Skylab. Still, Dinosaur was the first orbital space plane that got beyond the whole paper stage and was in serious development with mock-up and a launch vehicle ready for it. I feel it probably did not have adequate heat shielding for its intended flight profile, and it also certainly had far too much lift. It is very difficult to make sure that Dinosaur lands where it's supposed to, and potentially it would need better computer equipment on board in order to handle its flight profile, which would make it heavier. While the space shuttle, due to various requirements, could not pick up on its basic design of putting the space plane at the top of the rocket, the space shuttle did benefit from some of the research done in support of this program. And of course, it has a legacy continuing in the Air Force and Boeing's own X-37, as well as Dream Chaser. Thanks to Dennis R. Jenkins for Space Shuttle Developing an Icon, the book that much of the information I'm presenting here is from. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.